right. So last week we talked about uh, our first of what's I think going to be a three part series of behind the scenes. And as part of the companion to that, I put out a blog post. It just got published. I, I want to share the screen to just kind of go over and, and recap what we talked about because putting together the highlights, it was a pretty dense episode. So here's the episode 17 behind the scenes part one. Um, we're gonna, we decided we want to talk about the phases of a live stream, how to organize a live stream using click, click up, web hooks, scheduling the live stream in Google Calendar, and we use dev flows. And as part of that, we realized we need to do a full dev flows episode. <laughs> um, and then planning yeah. the live stream and generating the transitions with Lambda and Shot Stack, and then using recognition um, segment detection to detect the timestamps of the segments. So that's as far as we got in one hour. And again, <laughs> like part of our learning in this process is that take what you think is going to be an hour and divide it by two. Yeah. So or I the other takeaway could also be that we talk a lot. So. Yes. <laughs> oh, and I guess tying this in with, um, with the weekend, you know, as part of developing this automation, you think, okay, on the one, it's really fun, it's really exciting, but think, oh, am I... Am I doing enough automation? Is this is this right? And then, um, so last Friday, I had wandered down downtown um, to kind of take a walk at the afternoon. And to be honest, there was um, sometimes Amazon puts on these free ice cream events. And so my two older kids and I, we thought, let's wander down and see if we can get some free ice cream. And it turned out to be AWS Builders Day. And there was a really good talk by Swami Siva Subramaniam and Peter DeSantis um, on automation. I wanted to play a little clip that I got from that, that made me feel a bit better. So it's really to focus on actually area where you own and really look at uh, how you can delight our customers. But also at our scale, look for ways we can optimize it. You know, the Peter jokingly mentioned three gen build automation. That is an example of where we do a lot of wasted manual work. That's a great example of not having to do manual work. We hire these amazing builders and we make them actually run scripts and do manual work. These are examples of, again, make things better for all of us and also for future builders to come and join our team. So, uh, That was a good answer. It's hard to improve on it. Uh, you know, we always start with the customer. And that's like the easiest litmus test for how to figure out what's the most important. All right. So I guess my takeaway from that is okay, even at AWS, they're still working on their automation. So it's okay if 17 episodes in, there's still some, uh, some, some rough spots around the edges. But part of documenting this process, part of building out this, um, this blog post, it was really good for, you know, you find that as you write it down, you realize, oh, actually, there's a little bit of a, a logical hole here. I need to, to clean this up. Yeah. So that's why it took a few other days to kind of get this out. Uh, no, I think so, that, that goes back to the culture of writing. I think writing stuff down makes it so much better in terms of giving you clarity of thought. Um, I think it's, a, it's an exercise that we've learned or from what AWS does internally, and I think it, everyone should try it out. It makes a big difference to the way you think about anything that you're doing or any decisions you're making. It's funny, looping back to the, uh, to the kids, we're actually having this discussion with our older ones just recently is saying when you write things down exactly you realize either sometimes you can have a great idea it sounds great in your head because you haven't taken the time to write it out and once you write it out you realize oh it's maybe it's circular it's it's not yeah. not as good as you thought or it is good and then you can publish it correct completely agree well as part okay. of what we we went over we talked about you know how the automation works the live stream are going through a couple of different phases we start with hey, the Stephen, I think uh, we need to bring that up on the oh, screen sorry let's let me do that thank you let's put this in there we go great so we talked about how a live stream it starts in a phase so for example there's the planning phase where it's just we have a guest and then um, we have a scheduled phase. So once we have a guest and an email address and a date and time nailed down, we can then move the, the phase from plan to scheduled and that can fire off a web hook, which can then you know, send a calendar invite. So we showed how to do that. <laughs> in the blog post, we talk about how in general these, these web hooks work. So we have a transition from one state to another. It's going to fire off some information about the event 
and then our API endpoint can can handle that event and do whatever it wants to it. Um, so yeah. we talk about that. We talk about in in our case, we're using the ClickUp API. So we say that a thing goes from planned to scheduled. So oh, okay, we have a schedule. So let's send out a Google Calendar invite. Um, and then we used dev flows to do that. And then we put that data back in. So it kind of closes the loop. And here's an example of the dev flow that we, we showed. So this is the endpoint that receives that event. And then we apply some JSON structure to it. And then we can send it out to Google Calendar. Here's, here's a date for the live stream. Here's a date for maybe a planning meeting that can be you know, the day before, a few days before. There's a link to this really neat language called JSONata, which is the uh, the computation language that, that joins the nodes, so you can reshape one JSON into another. So again, we'll get into this in the full uh, full dev flows episode. Let's see, we covered uh, planning the live stream and generating transitions using Lambda function and shot stack. So our really cool videos that we play in between the segments. They start off with this empty box here, and then we can take, um, we can put a piece of text here, and then we talked about how these videos are engineered with a, a few frames of black in the beginning, um, before that little jingle, and that, yeah. what we're trying to find, is I put that here, is this. This is how we can think about how our, um, how our live stream, is broken down. So we have that little black frame and then our transition jingle, which is nine seconds. And then this is us talking right now, this content, and then it will be bordered by the next one. Yeah. And then let's see, we talked about how this is, this is the, the architecture for this. We have for, this is a very standard pattern when you're dealing with web hooks because they want to return right away. So whatever right. is calling this function, it can return right away, but it can also push a job to a queue. And this can take you know, a few minutes, a few seconds, and then update, give us the information that we need. In this case, uh, we get the little MP4 file that has that transition, and then we can put it in a place that's ready to go. We talked about recognition. Yeah. Recognition is where we take our recording, we put it into S3, we launch a recognition job, this goes into SNS, and then SNS will push to a queue, which will then tell us uh, it will find the start and end time. So the start and end time of this particular piece of content, it will put that back into ClickUp, where I can then um, adjust it or play with it, preview it, and then send it on to the rest of our highlight process. So it was a lot for an hour, but I thought it was a really successful <laughs> Um, episode. Um, I wanted to ask you, Raul, after kind of going over that and planning for next week, um, what are some of the patterns that came out um, thinking about automation in general? So I think um, the first one would basically be that automation needs some kind of a trigger, whether it be webhooks, whether it be uh, you know an explicit call, whether it be some kind of a message via an SNS topic or you know, SQS, uh, a message in a queue. But you basically need some kind of a trigger. And that's where I think the entire event-driven architecture kind of building your stuff like an event-driven architecture makes so much sense. It just enables automation in little pieces. If you had to you know, design automation for an entire monolithic system, taking into account all those different pieces and latencies and all the other criteria, automation is hard. You want to make it easy, keep it event-driven, keep it in small chunks. That way you can carve out the pieces you want to automate. And if everything talks asynchronously to each other, like events, it just makes it really easy. Um, then I think we talked about uh, Lambda function URLs. Yes. It's something that I am a big fan of. <laughs> we're going to talk about those. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about that really soon, actually. But yeah, we did talk cover Lambda function URLs, and that's actually how these are all triggered, right? Because uh, before you had to use API Gateway, API even Gateway. for a, yeah. and even for a quick, you know, ten line Python thing, and messing yeah. around with cores, API Gateway, all those settings. Correct. Uh, 
not having to do that anymore. I think it's a real, uh, a real win. I agree. For automation, I think Lambda function URLs is one of the most amazing recent developments that has come about. Uh, the other one was DevFlows, where I think the whole reason why we created DevFlows and why I love it is because I have found it to be one of the simplest ways to stitch together a bunch of different services to achieve outcomes. And my brain now naturally gravitates towards the flow programming paradigm where we're talking about data flowing through a whole series of processing nodes and coming out of it. And by the way, for, for me, the big aha moment was when I started doing a lot of IoT related stuff uh, or my automation at home, um, I started using Node-RAID. And if you haven't no used Node-RAID for you know, simple home automation and stuff like that, try it out. It's awesome. And unfortunately, I, that doesn't scale to large enterprise applications. So we had to kind of redo a version of Node-RAID um, that actually was built on AWS as a native platform um, and has the same flow programming paradigm under the hood. So yeah, I think that was one of the other takeaways from last yeah, week. Absolutely. I, I really like the um, the flow programming paradigm and the drawing out an acyclic graph. It's very easy to reason about, to think about. And um, if you can rep your, represent your problem that way, like on a whiteboard, and then basically move it to something like DevFlows, um, it's it's a really yeah. nice way of keeping that mental model in sync with the actual the actual process. Exactly. Um, great. And I think mm -hmm. the next takeaway was making automation night important is really key, especially in an event driven architecture. And that sometimes is harder than than we think it is. <laughs> Because the one thing that's never promised is events being in sequence. So the ordering of events is something that we just take for granted. It's the natural you know, way that we think about things. But in reality, you have to, when you're doing automation, you have to plan for the fact that these events may not be in order. And so you have to account for um, sequencing and item potency, which is if a processing has, or if one item has been processed, if it shows up again, it shouldn't make any difference. There's this great joke about, um, okay, here we go. This is a, a great programmer joke. I want to put this on the screen um, that I think captures what you were saying. There are only two problems in distributed systems <laughs> exactly once delivery. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, guaranteed order of messages. Number two, exactly once delivery. Absolutely. Um, I think that really captures it, right? You you send this message out into the into the world and you have to plan for these scenarios of it might not happen Correct. in order, it might not it might happen twice. Correct. And so that is yeah, that's an incredibly hard problem. And you have to build your systems to be able to be resilient to that. Um, so yeah, so that's uh, something to take care of. Then um, you have to have some sort of monitoring or observability for whatever automation you're creating because the more pieces that are kind of you know, talking to each other asynchronously, you want to be able to know what where everything is or what state something is in. And as a corollary to that, you should be able to start off from any state and be able to proceed just in case everything collapses at that particular point of time. So that's really important too. I was experimenting with this um, over the weekend. I hooked up some of the, some of the automation to a Slack channel using this uh, AWS SNS to Slack publisher. Yeah. And I think one thing that's really interesting to end up finding is that there's a certain rhythm of things you end up hearing. Because you hear the, okay, I know that it takes two seconds for the transition video to generate, and then it'll take another second for it to post back. And so you hear this click, 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 and almost that little pattern recognizer in your head. It's like, oh, wait, some, you'll, you'll know when it sounds <laughs> off. Just like if, I don't know, if you're listening to a song and they leave a note out. Yeah. Uh, so it's neat to have True. that. Yeah. But in, in I mean, that's something to, to kind of watch out for in, in asynchronous because 
in an asynchronous event driven model you're waiting for an event right you don't know when that event may come there's no timeline associated with it uh so you either have to have an explicit timeout but then what if the message comes back after the timeout you again that's when the item potency plays a role and um yeah you you have to basically prepare for that kind of mechanism to operate so i'd say um having some kind of monitoring that tells you when something is off um is incredibly important uh to that setup and yeah um anything else we missed no i think that that's great all right well i wanted to do uh another segment which we'll talk about what's coming up next week that'll be a short one and then we want to skip ahead to uh talking about uh the sam lambda functions that we talked about uh using dev spaces all right i'll cue in the, awesome. the next transition here goes <laughs> 